Uh, Psalm 66, uh, this evening, uh, we understand that uh, God is the Lord over our hearts. Uh, we understand that the God is over the world. He is Lord over that. He acts within us. He acts outside of us. He acts on our behalf. He does things for us. He does things to us. He does things in the world to shape us. He does things in us in order to shape the world, very similar to what uh, Carolyn had mentioned about the, the first, second, third century Christians and how God used all these sufferings and persecutions to shape Christianity as we know it, as Orthodox Christianity even uh, now. Uh, he shaped those in those three centuries. Uh, Job says, man is born to trouble as sparks fly upward. Uh, paraphrase in that verse. And so as we uh, move in uh, to Psalm 66, uh, the, despite the appearances of trouble and trial and affliction in our lives, despite the appearance of the COVID-19 virus and all the issues that we have in our life because of it, uh, despite all of the unrest and turmoil in our nation because of what's going on in Minneapolis and throughout the rest of our country, uh, there is... Uh, a purpose and plan in all of these things. And uh, Psalm 66 helps us as we move through the psalm to understand that as we deal with trials and tribulations, the Christian in particular has a better understanding of these things because God is working in us and through us through these trials, through these tribulations. And as the psalmist says in Psalm 66, because of these things, we should glorify God. And so as we look at Psalm 66, we'll read the passage in its entirety. It's actually, I think it's the longest real one we've come to so far in book number two of the Psalms, Psalm 66. Uh, to the chief musician, a song or psalm. Make a joyful noise unto God, all ye lands. Sing forth the honor of his name. Make his praise glorious. Say unto God, how terrible art thou in thy works. We could even say how awesome, if it makes us understand that even better. How terrible art thou in thy works. Through the greatness of thy power shall thine enemies submit themselves unto thee. And it's actually kind of interesting how Mia says that she's thankful that God is all powerful because it kind of goes along with Psalm 66. So if she wanted to come preach the message, she'd probably do just a good enough job as well. But she says, Submit themselves unto thee, all the earth, verse 4, shall worship thee and shall sing unto thee. They shall sing to thy name, Selah. Psalmist goes on and says, Come and see the works of God. He is terrible in his doing toward the children of men. He is awesome. He is, uh, this terrible is not the way we would see terrible today. It's a, it's a different form. It's not bad, but it's a, it's a awestruck type uh, of thought. He turned the sea into dry land. They went through the flood on foot. There did you rejoice in him. He ruleth by his power forever. His eyes behold the nations. Let not the rebellious exalt themselves. Selah. Oh, bless our God, ye people, and make the voice of his praise to be heard, which holdeth our soul in life, and suffereth not our feet to be moved. For thou, O God, hast proved us, thou hast tried us as silver is tried, thou brought us into the net, thou laidest affliction upon our loins, thou hast caused men to ride over our heads, we went through fire and through water, but thou brought us out into a wealthy place." I will go into thy house with burnt offerings. I will pay thee my vows, which my lips have uttered, and my mouth have spoken when I was in trouble. I will offer unto thee burnt sacrifices of fatling with the incense of rams. I will offer bullocks with goats, selah. Come and hear, all ye that fear God, and I will declare what he hath done for my soul. I cried unto him with my mouth, and he was extolled with my tongue. If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. But verily God hath heard me. He hath attended to the voice of my prayer. Blessed be God, which hath not turned away my prayer, nor his mercy from me. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for Psalm 66. Father, we thank you for this 
wonderful psalm as we take a look at how and why we should worship you this evening. Father, allow the text to be unfolded before us. Father, give us clear thought and clear uh, direction as we look in your word this evening. Uh, Father, apply it to our hearts. Use this to be able so that we may be more conformed into the image of Christ. And these things we ask in your son's precious and holy name. Amen. As we want to give you kind of a summary of the text, and then we'll kind of hit a few high points this evening, and then we'll, uh, we'll be done. Uh, he, there is, you can kind of see like four sections in this psalm, uh, four stanzas. If you were to read Hebrew poetry, four strophes is what they would call in Hebrew poetry, uh, but four, four stanzas. And then the first stanzas, the first four verses of the psalm, Psalm 66, and you'll see in the first four verses, a universal call to worship God. You'll see a universal call uh, to worship God. And it, he be, actually, in the psalm, begins to suggest what a suitable song of praise would consist of within those four verses. So he, you have the psalmist calling for a universal call, telling the whole nations, all the nations of the earth, to worship God. And then he kind of gives us something to think about as we begin to so what does a song consist of? What does a song or a hymn consist of? And he begins to put those in place as well in the first four verses. In the second section, it's uh, almost as if he's kind of narrowing down the focus. In the second section, you see a national call to worship. A, a national call to worship in which he is calling uh, the nation of Israel to remember the terrible works of God, to remember the awesome works of God, to remember how God led them out of Egypt, as we mentioned this morning, on eagles' wings, and what all of that deliverance entailed with the ten plagues, um, with the Red Sea. And so the psalmist is wanting to the nation of Israel now, verses 5 through 7, to remember what God has done in the past and calls them now to worship God. And he kind of begins to make the application there going forward that uh, the people at this time were perhaps in a similar situation where things didn't look good, uh, things were out of uh, a line with what they had understood and undergone with. And so the, the psalmist is trying to uh, make the application that even though they're going through tough times now, we should praise God because of what he's done in the past. Okay, so you have... One through four, a universal call, five through seven, with application to the nation of Israel, a national call uh, to worship. And so then in verses eight through 12, you have the psalmist turning uh, inward. I should say verses 13 through 15, he turns inward because of the personal pronoun, I. Verses 13 through 15, you have the universal call of worship, one through seven, Five, uh, 8 through 12 is the national call. 13 through 15 is a personal call to worship. He is saying, I will go into thy house with burnt offerings. Uh, he is telling the Lord now in this psalm that this is what how he is going to worship. This is what he is going to do in worship. And then 16 through 20 is almost kind of brings it back out a little bit and says, okay, this is how I'm going to worship, but in public this is how I'm going to worship. And so you'll see a this flow of thought throughout the psalm of the universal call of worship, a national call of worship, a personal call of worship, and then a public call of worship as we move forward. So in the first four verses, you see, make a joyful noise unto God, all ye lands. Sing forth the honor of his name. Make his praise glorious. Verse 20 goes on to say in verse 3, say unto God, how terrible art thou in thy words. To the greatness of thy power shall thine enemies submit themselves unto thee. All the earth shall worship thee and shall sing unto thee. They shall sing to the name Selah. The psalmist, we do not know who the title, the author is a psalm. We do not, there is no author in here. This is an anonymous psalm, if you will. Uh, it's a psalm or a psalm. But he's calling not just the nation of Israel, but he's calling all the nations of the world to worship God, to praise God. Because uh, let's face it, there is, even though the nation of Israel is within the bounds and sphere of God's authority, there is no nation on earth that's outside of his sphere of authority either. And so the psalmist is saying, 
not only should the nation of Israel worship God, but all the nations of the world should worship God. And why should we worship God? Because God is sovereign over everything. Verses 1 through 4, God is sovereign over everything. God has complete control over everything. He is in total control, and he has total authority over everything. And because of who God is, the psalmist says, that creates the expectation and even an obligation to worship God. He basically is saying there's no excuse for you not to worship God. If God is sovereign, if God is the king, if God is the creator, you remember what he has done for the nation of Israel and how powerful he is. There is no excuse for you not to worship God. Why, why, why is there no excuse even for the unbeliever not to worship God? But why is uh, The question can be asked, can it not? We, we saw this morning that a believer has the right obligation to worship God because of what God has done for us. We, he has saved us, he has bought us, he has adopted us into his family, he's caused us now, because of what he's done for us personally in our salvation, to worship him. But this psalmist is proclaiming to the nations that they should worship him because of how great he is. A great God deserves a full response, a full uh, helping of worship, if you will, from the nations of the world. He, he's calling for a worldwide worship. He, you, you're going to have to respond to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And the basis for this call of worship is because of the greatness of God. To think about how great God is. I mean, to, to look at this, the creation to look at your salvation, uh, to look at how God brings you through trials in your life, through adversities in your life. Uh, there's nothing we can say that can say how small God is because the more we think about God and his infinite mercy and his infinite power and his infinite grace it should cause us as believers, and it should cause also even the entire world to understand that God is a great God, and we should worship him because of the greatness of God. That even verse 3 says that the enemies submit themselves unto thee. It's an interesting thought. That even the God's enemies are submitting themselves to God. And you can, there's kind of a, a different thoughts here. You could say that well, these enemies are pretending to obey God. The thought is, is the enemies could be pretending to obey God. Well, why would they pretend to obey God? Because in their pride, they think they don't need God. And we run into people all the time, do we not, thinking they do not need God. But because God is in control, they may not realize God is in control of all things. They unknowingly submit to God, but in their heart, they are pride, arrogant, rebellious people. And we're often that way sometimes, are we not? In, in our pride, we, we intellectually know that God's in control. We intellectually know that God is Lord. He is sovereign. He is all-powerful. He is great. And yet, pride wells up within us sometimes, and we want to take control of the situation. But we want to say to God, no, I have this. But even the enemies submit themselves unto God. And so we see there is, though we do know, because we have all of the Bible written for us, this was written some 3,500 years ago or so, we have the Bible written for us, and we know there is coming a day that every knee will bow and worship the Lord. Every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, it says there. So this psalm is now telling the nations of the world, the enemies of God, to worship God now, because if you don't make the choice to worship God, you're going to have to do it whether you like it or not in the future. So there's this universal call for the nations to worship God. And he begins to ground this universal call in verses 5 through 7 as he begins to show us. He says, come and see the works of God. He is terrible in his doing for the children of men. He turned the sea into dry land. They went through the flood on foot. There did we rejoice in him. 
It, it's almost as if there is this uh, anticipation of expectation to try to get these people to come see what God has done. Look what God has done for the nation of Israel. He's caused the dry land to appear in the middle of the Red Sea so that they can walk on it. The very great, powerful nation, Egypt, rode on it as well, and then God crashed the waves and killed them all. I mean, how great is God? Look at all the works that he's done. He's provided them food in the wilderness where they could not farm. In an agrarian culture, they could not farm in the wilderness. It's desert, and how did they eat? Every day, God provided them manna. Even in their complaining and murmurings and grumblings, God gave them quail. I mean, look at the great things that God has done. He's, he's trying to get the world to see the, all of these things that the Lord has done for them. This is an awesome God. I mean, you can recall the Exodus account. I mean, listen to Moses write for us in Exodus 14, 21 through 31. And Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord caused the sea to go back by a strong east wind all that night, and made the sea dry land, and the waters were divided. And the children of Israel went into the midst of the sea upon the dry ground, and the waters were a wall unto them on their right hand and on their left. And the Egyptians pursued and went in after them to the midst of the sea, even all Pharaoh's horses, his chariots, and his horsemen. And it came to pass that in the morning watch the Lord looked unto the host of the Egyptians through the pillar of fire and of the cloud and troubled the host of the Egyptians. And, and listen to how Moses writes this. And he took off their chariot wheels that drave them heavily. So the Egyptians said, Let us flee from the face of Israel. For the Lord fighteth for them against the Egyptians. The Egyptians knew who they were fighting. The blessed L, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, that is Yahweh, that is the I am of Exodus 3. The Egyptians knew who they were fighting. And the Lord said unto Moses, Stretch thy hand over the seas, that the waters may come again upon the Egyptians, upon their chariots, and upon their horsemen. And then Moses stretched forth his hand over the sea, and the sea returned to his strength when the morning appeared. And the Egyptians fled against it, and the Lord overthrew the Egyptians in the midst of the sea. I mean, how can we not praise this God for taking care of his people? I mean, what a mighty act that God has done for his people. And the psalmist is trying to get us to understand this and to come look at this and to read about this and understand that we should, as the nations of the world, worship this great God. He's saying this is the God that you should worship. We're, we're no match for this God. As an individual, we are no match for this God. We cannot say that I am better than this God. I don't need God. The psalmist is saying, no, this is a great and awesome God. Look at the terrible works which he has done in the Old Testament. You are no match for him. In your pride, in your arrogance, in your rebellion, you are no match for this God. Verses 8 through 12, we see this national call, call of praise. You begin to see the, uh, the pronouns change. Well, bless our God, ye people, and make the voice of his praise to be heard, which holdeth our soul in life, and serveth not our feet to be moved. You begin to see this possession now. There's a national call to praise. For thou, O God, verse 10, hast proved us. Thou hast tried us as silver is tried. Thou broughtest us into the net. Thou laidst affliction upon our loins. Thou hast caused men to ride over our heads. We went through fire and through water, but thou brought us unto us out into a wealthy place. So there's a call, a national call to worship. This is a command, a, a national command to worship God. And why should they worship God? The psalmist says, you know this God. You have a personal relationship with this God. This is why you should worship this God. You have seen his mighty works firsthand. You've seen him work in marvelous ways. You know the truth in which I'm talking about in this psalm, the nation of Israel, he says. You need to worship this God. In light of our history, he says, you should worship this God. He needs all glory and honor due to him. And you have greater grounds because you are his child. You are his children. You have greater grounds 
The nation of Israel, he says, to worship this God because of what he's done for you. And are we not even Christians? We ourselves are even greater than that? That we, as Christians, should worship God? We have greater grounds even more so than the nation of Israel, and even more so than the nations of this world, because of what God has done for you? You think about what I... I mean, we took the Lord's table this morning, and then all that entails... Christ's broken body and his blood. What right do we have to procure God's glory for ourselves? What right do we have to go about our daily lives and not even think about God? Because our thoughts do not need God. So what right do we have to even think that we don't need him? And yet the psalmist is causing, calling us to praise him, to glorify him. He goes on and he says, that God has proved us. He's tried us as silver is tried in a fire. The, the idea of thou brought us, us into the net, referencing back the Red Sea, God had put this affliction, this trial on the nation of Israel. The psalmist says we were as if we were fish caught in a net. We had no place to turn. And the only hope is that God worked through that trial, through that temptation to allow the nation of Israel to go through on dry ground. After all the nation has been through, there has been given them greater grounds to praise God. I mean, think about even in our own personal trials. And Peter says this about our own trials. He says in 1 Peter 1, 6 and 7, Wherein ye greatly rejoice now for a season, if ye need be, ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations. And we can say manifold trials. That the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found in the praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. What, what is it about trials and adversities that God does for you that we glorify Him? Sometimes the sole reason you go through trials is that you're able to see God's grace in your life. And that grace turns to glorifying God. That's why the church sign says grace and glory differ little. One is the seed, and the other is the flower. You think that God pours out grace on your life, what the answer to that grace is, is you glorify God. And more often than not, the grace that we see is in trials and afflictions. And he, the psalmist reminds us of the nation of Israel going through the Red Sea. That trial, that deep affliction for the whole nation. And you get to the other side of uh, Exodus chapter 14, and then you, you see in Exodus 15, you see this wonderful psalm or hymn to God for what God has done for the nation. The trials that Israel went through were trials that were or like what happened to the spoils of war. They went through a purification process, through the fire, through the water. Numbers 31, 23 says, Everything that may abide the fire, you shall make it go through the fire, and it shall be clean. Nevertheless, it shall be purified with the water of separation, and all that abideth not the fire, you shall make it go through the water. I mean, think about it. If you're, you're talking about the spoils of war, and we apply that, that analogy to our own life. We are at war with God. We are enemies with that God, are we not, before our salvation? We become his child because of our ultimate surrender to God. 
We, in essence, become his spoils. And what happens to the spoils of warfare, according to Numbers 31, that has to go through a purification process. So, in our lifetime, after our salvation, we have to go through purification, we have to go through testing, we have to go through cleansing, because there's dross in our life, right? If we're going to use the silver terminology, to purify silver, you have to get the dross out. And so we go, through the, we go through the fires to be purified, to be sanctified. That the process of refining silver teaches us a lot about our, about our own afflictions and about our own trials. Because when it comes to afflictions and trials, we tend to think of it in a general way. We usually, we tend to think of it like this. Uh, whatever trial is going on in our life, we ask someone to pray for us, and then we ask that we get through it. Right? I mean, that's kind of what the thought processes are in our trials. But there's a much deeper uh, thing going on here. Very much like the refining processes of silver. I mean, think about if you are refining silver, you have to give that refining process its undivided attention. You can't just turn it on like a boiling pot of water and walk away. You have to be, someone has to be there, turn on the flames, begins to see all the impurities come up to the top, and somebody has to be continually being there to scoop it out. So the one who's being doing the refining process has the undivided attention of refining the silver. So just because you go through a trial, just though you go through the afflictions of life, does not mean that God is not watching you. In fact, he has his undivided attention on you as he begins to try to sanctify you and purify you. Uh, Malachi 3.3, And he shall sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. Malachi says he's sitting there purifying his silver, and he shall purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver. To do what? That they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. So, there's an undivided attention in the silver refining process. The Lord is, has his undivided attention on your life as he brings you through the affliction. That he is very carefully regulated as you go through this affliction. But this process can never be too hot or too cold. The heat has to be just right for the process to work. And then it's continually repeated until all the dross is taken out. So when we think about this, as we begin to look at our trials and afflictions in our own life, God's going to turn up the heat just enough for us to realize that we cannot do it on our own. He's going to cause us to realize that this trial is too much for me, and I need you. Trials and afflictions are put to a point in our life that God is working in us and through us through that affliction. But think about this also. If, if we're the silver going through this process, what do you think happens when we murmur, complain in the process? We're throwing the dross back into the silver. So what happens? We have to repeat the process all over again. We have to continually repeat the process all over again because we're grumbling and complaining about the process. Instead of accepting the grace in our lives and praising God for what he's doing in our life. So as God is putting you through the trials and through the afflictions, God is giving you his undivided attention. He is the refiner. He is refining you, purifying you, uh, and Christian terminology, he's sanctifying you through these afflictions. 
And think about this. God has specifically designed the affliction for you. The afflictions that he has in mind for me are going to be different than the afflictions he has for you. The timing of the affliction is going to be different for me as it is for you. Because he has you in mind when you, he sends you through these things. He has me in mind when he sends me through these things. And just because we go through it doesn't mean that they disappear after we go through it. The process has to continually go through. We continually have to go through the process. God is not forgetting us. In fact, God is actually has, it's almost as if God is more intent on our lives when we're going through the process of affliction. And just because we go through it once doesn't mean it doesn't have to happen again. Because sometimes we struggle and we continually feel like sometimes we continually go through the same thing over and over and over again. That's why James says in James 1, 2, some of you may have it memorized. He says, count it all joy. What? When you fall into diverse temptation. Diverse trials. Why do we count it all joy? Because God is working in you and through you for you to be glorifying Him. The psalmist is reminding us we are going to be silver tried as fire. Why? So we can glorify God. That God's grace is going to be poured out in our lives to glorify Him. According to Scripture, your trials, your afflictions, are an occasion for God to deliver you in His wonderful grace. And at the time, it doesn't seem like that. At the time, we just want to get through it. At the time, we want people to pray for us so that we can get through it. At the time, sometimes we may pull up our bootstraps and see if we can muscle our way through it. But as James says, we need to count it all joy that God has brought these things into our lives. But why, why does God do these things? Why does God bring us through these afflictions? Why, why does God bring us through these trials? Because God is a God of love. Because God is a God of mercy. He's a God of grace. And he's proving to you and I how faithful he is. I mean, think about it, that when we're going through the affliction or we go through the trial, we may be going through one right now. To understand that God is even more watching you I'm not saying that he's not watching you all the time, but he's almost more intently watching you because he's bringing you through this refining process. And God's going to keep coming through for you time and time and time again. There's a universal call of praise. There's a national call of praise. Because of these things, there is a personal call of praise. Verses 13 through 15. I will go, I will go into thy house with burnt offerings. I will pay thee my vows, which my lips have uttered, and my mouth hath spoken when I was in trouble. I will offer unto thee burnt sacrifices of fatlings, with the incense of rams. I will offer bullocks with goats. Selah. And he brings it down to a personal level. We see the nation of Israel. We saw how that he refines the fire for silver for the nation of Israel and we made the application that he brings it to our life but in verses 13 through 15 the psalmist brings now the worship on a personal level and he says I will I will I will 
Four times in three verses, he says, I will offer sacrifices. I will praise him. I will worship him. Out of the abundance of his heart, he's giving to God his ultimate worship. If you can think of it on a New Testament level, this is what Paul is talking about in Romans 12. You see, in Psalm 66, this person is not doing it begrudgingly. And this person is not doing uh, the offering of sacrifice with the minimal amount. He's giving out of the abundance of his wealth, out of the abundance of his life. And so what Paul says to the Christian for what God has done, he says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service, your reasonable worship. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Psalm 66, he's giving out of the abundance all of these offerings. In Romans 12, the expectation for the believer is your reasonable worship is your everything. You can't just be a Christian and want to save you without winning the war. Because they're the same person. So what Paul is saying, in accordance to Psalm 66, is our worship should be our everything. Our life, our emotions, our ambitions, our desires, our thoughts, our everything. I will worship with my whole life. And then in verses 16 through 20, there's a public call. Verses 16 through 20, there's a public call. Come and hear all ye that fear God, and I will declare what he hath done for my soul. See, the, the, the psalmist is going to worship. And as he goes to worship, he's going to tell he's telling God all these things he's going to do at worship. And then as he gets there, he's going to start telling people what God has done for him in his life. Uh, I will declare what he hath done for my soul. I cried unto him with my mouth, and he was extolled with my tongue. If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me, but verily God hath heard me. He hath attended to the voice of my prayer. Blessed be God, which hath turned not away my prayer, nor his mercy from me. He, he, he's telling those now that he's come to worship with. This is how you worship. Right? Do not regard iniquity in your heart. Do not come to worship with sin in your life. Because why? The Lord will not hear. You give your all to God and do not hide iniquity in your heart. You come to worship repenting. You come to worship asking for forgiveness, confessing your sins. Telling people what God has done for you. As Spurgeon put it once, if you're listening to the devil, don't God expect God to listen to you. If you're listening to the devil, don't expect God to listen to you. We have this wonderful, great, awesome God. We have all of his works laid out before us in the Old Testament. We have all of his works laid out for us in the New Testament and how he has worked in each and every one of our lives. We must worship him. We must count it all joy as he brings us through all these trials and afflictions. Count it all joy when we when he meets us with trials. Count it all joy when he meets us with afflictions. This isn't something that's superficial. All right, I know that I should count it all joy. So God and joyful. And you just throw up your hands in, in designation. 
that this is you and God alone. In the midst of the fire, in the midst of being purified and sanctified, saying thank you. God, I can only do it through your grace and through your mercy. God, I'm going to worship you. I'm going to tell people when I get to the ability to be able to go to the church, I'm going to tell them what you're doing in my life. God, forgive me. If there's any sin within me, forgive me. That we may have a life that is joy unspeakable and full of glory. Not for self, but for God. Because he is the one who deserves unending praise. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for Psalm 66. Father, we thank you for those who have been able to come and gather with us this evening. Thank you for those who are watching online, Facebook. Father, help us to praise you in everything. Father, help us to count it all joy. Father, forgive us if we have complained and murmured when we have gone through the afflictions and fires. Father, help us this evening. These things we ask in your son's precious holy name. Amen. Let us stand and say.